Let's get ready to mortgage. He is the prince of programs, guru of guidelines, master of matrixes. He puts the fun in funding. Please welcome Mark, Mr. Mortgage, I tell. And he rides a bad motor scooter. <laughs> I love that song. Hey guys, my name is Mark Itell, and you are listening to the Mr. Mortgage Show. And man, we have an awesome, awesome show lined up for you this week. We're going to dive into the Fed's testimony. We're going to talk about why rate cuts aren't coming anytime soon. And that's not a surprise to anybody who listens to the show regularly. We've covered this data many, many times before. And the Fed has reinforced that once again this week by testifying before members of Congress. We're going to dive into that. We're going to dive into the weird real estate world that we currently live in, where if somebody asks you, is it a good time to buy or a good time to sell? The answer to both of those could be yes and we're going to cover why. Why is the real estate market only bad for those who aren't participating? And we're going to talk about the surprising statistics about who is actually participating in homeownership in 2024, because these numbers blew me away and why these people are unaffected by higher rates and higher prices and are able to move around. So guys, sit tight. We are going to dive into all of that. If you have questions or comments along the way, you can call or text 855-462-7292. That is the Anytime Hotline, 855 855- Four six two seven two nine two. Jen, my producer extraordinaire, is womaning the hotline, and she'll get your questions on the air. If you prefer to send them online, just head over to MrMortgageRadio.com. That's MrMortgageRadio.com. And right in the middle of the page is a big orange button that says, get your questions on the air. Click the button. Follow the instructions and Jen will read your questions on the air. Now that we've got the housekeeping out of the way, I encourage your questions and comments because we're going to cover a lot of great topics. So let's start by diving into the hot topic of the day, interest rates and the Federal Reserve. And when are these um, talked about rate cuts going to actually happen? And every time another person asks me, do I think this next meeting is rate cut time? I think about all of the old movies where the end of the world doomsdayers had the sandwich boards walking up and down the street saying, you know, repent, the end is near. Everybody, if you talk about something long enough, you're going to be right eventually. And the Federal Reserve will absolutely cut interest rates eventually. But if you're waiting for the Fed to do something before you do something when it comes to buying a house or selling a house, Uh, You're looking at the wrong target because we've talked about it many, many times. And I'll explain it again, why the Federal Reserve overnight interest rate doesn't impact mortgage rates. He can cut or raise rates and mortgage rates are going to do what they're going to do based on their influences, which are different, different influences than the overnight rate. Now, we all want rates to be cut because the overnight rate influences what we're paying on credit cards, what we're paying on home equity lines of credit. If we've got adjustable debt, we're running our business on a business line of credit. Man, our cost of money has gone up significantly over this rate hike environment. So for inflationary reasons, we're all rooting for rate cuts. But in my little specific world of real estate and real estate finance, the Fed rate really doesn't impact mortgage rates. And I've used this analogy many, many times, but I actually researched it to the 100th of a percentage point to make the point clear. In January, first week in January of 2023, mortgage rates were 6.5%. Now, that's just an average. Could have been a little lower, could have been a little higher, depending on your program. That's 2023. In 2024, rates were 67 So they came almost all the way back down to 6.5%. Interestingly enough... While the mortgage rates were almost identical, in January of 2023, the Fed funds rate was 4.33. In January of 24, it was 5.33, a full percentage point higher, yet the interest rates were almost identical for mortgages. So anybody who is out there professing 
that the Federal Reserve impacts mortgage rates which is just wrong. And you can look that data up yourself, guys. Pull up two charts side by side. Mortgage rates, Fed funds rates, and you'll see there's not a direct correlation. And in this instance, a full percentage point higher in the Fed funds rate did nothing to the mortgage, the 30-year mortgage rate. So got that out of the way. That one drives me nuts. But we're all rooting for rate cuts. As I mentioned, it's much, much more expensive in in interest rates, cost of debt. I mean, gosh, consumers are carrying well over a trillion dollars of credit card debt. So, So rate cuts can't come soon enough for those people, you know, because pretty soon the last well they're going to have to dip in is the equity in their homes. And they're holding on until the last minute because they've got these super low two, three, four percent interest rates in place. So not discounting the importance for the overall economic health of the consumer to have the Fed cut rates. So I wanted to just touch on that because we're paying way, way too much attention to the Fed and speaking about the affordability of housing. And I see Congress people do it all day and they're not making the correlation, which is fascinating to me that our leaders really, in some instances, don't seem to know what they're talking about, or at least not the specific topic, not not in an expert capacity anyway. Now let me jump into why this is not a bad real estate market if you are indeed in the market. Guys, people have never had this much equity in their lives, even in markets that people are touting as crashing. You know, some markets prices have pulled back eight and 10%. The tourist towns are seeing it a little bit in Southwest Florida. Guys, there's still a load of equity, 50, 60, 70% price increases. Real estate has doubled in some instances in the last four years. There's so much equity out there that people can afford a bit of a haircut before it ever, ever signals a crash. But here's where, here's what I'm getting at. This is a mind-blowing statistic. Now, Meredith Whitney, some of you guys know, she's called the oracle of the housing market. She was one of the early predictors of the housing crash in the early 2000s. So I do put credence in Meredith's data. And she recently was on CNBC talking about 70% of people who own real estate in this country are over 50 years old. Whoa, think about that for a minute, guys. 70% are over 50. If you drop the age to 40, it's 90%. That blows me away. And why do I think that's so important? Everybody's talking about inventory, inventory, inventory. When more sellers come to the market, all of a sudden it's going to push prices down. Well, what do the older people tend not to do? Move as much. So if they're settled in with a load of equity in a historically low interest rate because they were smart enough to buy or refi at the right time, I don't believe that they're suddenly going to want to sell those properties just because they're 60 or 65 years old. And a lot of people are aging in place healthier than ever before. My God, some of the 70-year-olds in our community look like 40-year-olds. It's phenomenal how well some people are taking care of themselves in life. So I don't see that being the end-all, be-all. And The reason they're unaffected is they have that equity. You know, the median age of a repeat buyer, meaning somebody who sold a home and buying another home is 58 years old. They've got all the equity in the property they're selling to put a big enough down payment down on the property they're buying to offset the higher price, the higher interest rate, the higher taxes. These people have equity wealth that they're playing with. They're playing with the house's money literally in this case. So they are far, far less affected by interest rate and certainly by price because they are sellers in this high market. So anyway, guys, you hear the music, you know what that means. That is my cue. We'll be back in a few. Sit tight on the other side of this very short break. We'll be back with more of the Mr. Mortgage Show. Drowning in bills, Struggling with mounting debts? The Wreck Refi is here to throw you a lifeline. We navigate you through the stormy seas of debts, guiding you to a shore of financial stability and peace of mind. Because your dreams matter, and so does your financial wellness. Visit recrefi.com. That's recrefi.com. recrefi.com. And let the Wreck Refi pave your path to monthly savings. Visit recrefi.com, your beacon of hope in a sea of debts. A service of Mark Itell, NMLS number 1929005, and the Mr. Mortgage Team. 
Welcome back to the Mr. Mortgage Show. Call us now at 855-462-7292. All right, we are back. My name is Mark Itell, and you are tuned in to the Mr. Mortgage Show. Guys, if you have questions or comments, please call or text 855-462-7292. That's 855 855- Four six two seven two nine two. That is the anytime hotline. Jen is will manning the hotline, and she'll get your questions on the air. Or you can head over to mrmortgageradio.com. That's mrmortgageradio.com. Right in the middle of the page is a big orange button. Click that button, follow the instructions, and uh, Jen will read your questions on the air. But hey, I was speaking to Jen during that break, and she reminded me it's been quite some time since we played the music trivia game. And since I threw out that reference to Bad Motor Scooter in the opening of the show, if you guys weren't here for the first 90 seconds, you missed it. But the first person to text me or call or email, whatever's easier for you, the name of the band and the lead singer, because that lead singer went on to be the front man for a few famous bands. So Bad Motor Scooter, who sang that song? First person with the right answer will get a Mr. Mortgage swag bundle, which I don't know if you can call a hat and a t-shirt a bundle, but it sounds pretty cool and they look pretty cool, guys. We'll send it out to the first person with the right answer. So thanks for reminding me of that, Jen. And uh, speaking of Jen, we are going to throw it her way because I know we've already gotten a couple questions in. So go ahead, Jen, when you're ready. Monique sent us this. If two friends buy a house together, does it make a difference which one is the borrower and which is the co-borrower? Also, what happens to my stake in the house if I die? You pronounce borrower so cute. I love it. (laughs) These are great questions, and we get them all the time. So regarding borrower and co-borrower, it it doesn't have any influence on the ownership status or the rights or the obligations, right? It's just one person has to go first on the application, and it's usually, usually the person with the higher credit score and the stronger income to debt profile is usually who who gets bumped to borrower but it doesn't matter it really it really doesn't it's more of an ego thing and you would be surprised it's usually the single ladies who are the breadwinners so think of the husband is doing uber eats and the wife is a mid-level executive at an insurance company that a dynamic is quite interesting, and it's usually the uh, powerful women who say, I'm not going to be the co-borrower, I want to be the borrower. But from the obligation and rights of ownership, it has v- no impact, no impact at all. So whoever fills the application out first, I guess, can start in the borrower uh, category. So I hope that helps. And then the second part of your question was super interesting. And th- I'm so, so very glad that you're thinking this all the way through because most of the time we don't. And there are several different title vestings that will dictate what happens to the property if you pass. So, for example, joint tenants with right of survivorship, it's exactly as it sounds. If you die, that's now your friend's house, 100%. So you'll want to talk to the title attorney. And if you need a title attorney, just shoot me an email. I'll find one for you that, you know, you can get on the phone. There's no obligation. There's no cost. In most instances, they'll just talk you through it, especially if they're the title attorney closing the transaction and walk through the different vesting. So it meets the goals that you have in mind. God forbid something happened and you wanted that to go to your sister or your son or your daughter and you didn't plan correctly and now suddenly it's your roommates or your your i don't know what you would call that right not roommate your your co-borrower it's your co-owner your friend so great great question and i really commend you on thinking it all the way through because most of the time people don't and we see that a lot with boyfriend girlfriend you know they're everything's going great they're madly in love i found the right person let's go buy a house oh my god i can't stand this guy anymore now what do i do how do i get out of it 
And a lot of people don't realize in that instance, and we might as well play this all the way out because it could apply to you as well. If your friend later down the road wants to sell or you want to sell, you both have to agree to sell. You're both on the mortgage, you're both on the deed. So the only way one person can get the other off the deed and off the mortgage is to refinance it. So in that instance, if she wanted out later or he wanted out later and you didn't, you could do a refinance, take the other individual off the deed and off the mortgage, and now you own it solely. And, you know, the reverse would be the case if you were the one that wanted out of the property. So it's not as easy as, oh, I'm just going to quit claim deed the property to my former boyfriend and he's going to take over the mortgage. Don't do that, guys. Don't, don't, don't do that. Uh, we see that a lot with people who are trying to um, get you to allow them to, quote unquote, take over your mortgage. I'll give you 10 grand and I'll start making the payments for you. Quit claim deed the property to me. Well, guys, you in both of those instances, boyfriend, girlfriend, or buyer, seller, you still own the debt. If that person stops paying, your credit is tanked. You're going through foreclosure. And in the example of boyfriend, girlfriend, you guys are going through it together. And if you don't like each other now, you can't imagine how much you're going to dislike each other going through that process. So quit claiming one off and the other takes it over is not the answer. And selling a property and quit claiming the buyer on and you off and allowing them to take over your mortgage. Man, oh man, that's risky, risky business. Not to mention it violates the due on sale clause. Um, there's a whole host of reasons why you don't want to do that. So anyway, great question. I went a little bit long, but it kind of branched into a couple of different scenarios that I did want to cover. So, and if, if you need more information regarding that, please reach out and, you know, let me back up just for a minute back to the whole, someone taking over your mortgage. That's a very attractive strategy right now for a lot of quote unquote investors, because as we mentioned in the opening segment, right? 70% of the people who own homes are over 50. They'll soon at some point be downsizing or, you know, moving into an assisted living facility or in with family. They're the prime target for somebody to say, hey, you know, I can give you a big down payment and take over your mortgage. But by taking over your mortgage, they're just making the payment for you. Assuming a mortgage is an entirely different thing. And assuming a mortgage, there's no risk because that person applies through the servicer, the company you make your payments to. And if they're approved, your mortgage becomes their mortgage. You're released from all obligations. It's like that mortgage was paid off and a new mortgage was issued. That's a very, very different scenario. But when people use the term, take over your mortgage, and I'm air quoting now, that's what a lot of people um, liken it to, an assumption. It's not an assumption, guys. An assumption releases you from the risk. The quote unquote, take over your mortgage releases you from your asset, right? You no longer own the house, but you own the debt, which is, I don't understand how anybody can make sense of that one as a seller. So anyway, now I'm going off on a bit of a tangent because every time the market gets stagnant, we see a lot of creativity and uh, this is no different. So, hey guys, you hear the music, you know what that means. That is my cue. We'll be back in a few. Sit tight on the other side of this short break. We'll be back with more questions and more of the Mr. Mortgage Show. Welcome back to the Mr. Mortgage Show. Call us now at 855-462-7292. All right, we are back. My name is Mark Itell, and this is the Mr. Mortgage Show. If you have questions or comments, just call or text 855-462-7292. That's 855 855- Four six two seven two nine two. That is the anytime hotline, and Jen is womaning the hotline. She'll get your questions on the air, or you can head over to MrMortgageRadio.com. That's MrMortgageRadio.com. There's a big orange button in the middle of the screen. Click that button, follow the instructions, and Jen will read your questions on the air. But hey, guys, I went long-winded on that last answer, so I'm going to toss it to Jen right now and get through some of these questions. Hey, Jen, go ahead. Jerry called this one in. I'm planning to sell my home and buy another immediately. I currently have a VA loan, 
Can I use my VA loan back to back or is it one time only? Hey, this is a great question, Jerry. Just like a backstreet boy, brother, back to back. You can close on your sale in the morning and your purchase in the afternoon of the very same day. So great, great question. Hugely misunderstood by a lot of people. If you have a VA loan, that entitlement, as long as it's in good standing, that loan wasn't foreclosed on, you sold the house, paid it off, that entitlement restores. You can use it multiple times. There's no limit on how many times you can use it as long as your entitlement is restored. So wonderful, wonderful question. I was going to try to sing a Backstreet Boys song, but guys, my music knowledge is limited to rock and roll apparently because um, nothing popped in my head, yet songs from the 60s and 70s live in there. So I don't know what that tells you about me. Anyway, great question, my man. If you need more more information, uh, you know how to reach us. I'll be happy to jump on the phone and help you any way I can. Hey, Jen, throw me another question. Brian sent this text. Is it possible to get an equity line on an investment property? It's a duplex and fully leased. Hey, Brian, great, great question, my man. That's two in a row. Obscure programs that nobody knows about and nobody understands. Yes, There are equity line programs just like there are on a primary, right? There's a credit line issued against the equity. You can write checks. You can use the credit card. You can draft against it. When you pay it down, it restores the balance. The same equity line structure is available on up to four unit properties. Now, the interest rates aren't as attractive and the percentage of the value that they'll loan is not as aggressive as a primary residence, but an equity line on an investment property is a great, great strategy if you want to extract cash to either renovate the property or buy another investment property. And then you can use the landlord loan and you don't even have to disclose personal income because the old school way to take equity out of an investment property is to refi it. But just like primary residence loans, investment property loans, interest rates were much lower two and three years ago. So there's a lot of people out there sitting on investment property loan interest rates that they'll never see again in their lifetime. And they don't want to do a cash out refi. So the equity line on the investment property opens up a whole new opportunity for them and they get to keep that ultra low interest rate. So great, great question. We don't talk about this one. I I don't think we, we talk about this at all because it's such a rare question, but I greatly appreciate you bringing that one up because a lot of people don't know that even exists and a lot of lenders don't do it. There's a few specialty lenders that provide that loan program. We're blessed to have a couple of them in our portfolio so we can provide that service. But anyway, not a sales pitch on us, but a great, great question. If you need more information, please just reach out. I'll be happy to walk you through how exactly a HELOC on a two unit would look. So great question, my man. Thanks. Let's keep them rolling. Go ahead, Jen. Natalie emailed this question. I own a townhouse that I rent out. I'd like to sell it, but my tenant asked if I'd consider a lease option. I don't have a mortgage now. Could I pull some cash out and still do a lease option? That was Natalie. This isn't, I mean, what do we have? The the investor club meeting today, right? Another great question. So yes, you can do the cash out refi and set the lease option up. One has nothing to do with the other. You know, you're collecting a monthly rental payment now, and that'll be used to offset the principal interest taxes and insurance on the cash out refinance that you are thinking of doing, and then put the lease option in place with the tenant. That's perfectly, perfectly fine. So yeah, great question. Another one that I don't think we get very often. So I appreciate that. Jen, do you have another one ready? Okay, let's go. Eric sent this one. I found an awesome barn dominium in Tennessee. My realtor says I have to pay cash because there are no mortgages for this style house. Is this true? Wrong. (laughs) It's not true, Eric. Um, Man, and there are some really cool barn dominiums, guys. If you haven't looked at that, whether, whether you're a fan of the idea or not, You've got to at least look and admire and respect the architecture that goes into some of these now. It sounds like it's, you know, a barn with a bedroom in it, but man, it is nowhere 
the level of detail and the architecture that's going into some of these, it's amazing. I saw one uh, ground up build on YouTube. I watched the whole video. Thank God it was time lapse. But you walk through the inside of it doing this video tour and you'd think you were in some, you know, contemporary home on a golf course in a gated neighborhood in Pinehurst, North Carolina. And you go out the back door and you're on the side of a mountain, so probably in Tennessee. I don't know. Beautiful, beautiful. And then one wing is dedicated to, you know, vehicle and equipment storage. But my God, some of these homes are amazing. But no, that's not true. The caveat being, right, one thing you've got to consider and this is true with tiny homes, container homes, you know, uh, a one bedroom, one bath house. That's a unique property, right? You're going to need like comparables. That's the big caveat. If there are other barn dominiums within the distance parameters of the guidelines that govern appraisals, you're okay. If it's the only barn dominium in a subdivision, it might be a little bit more difficult, but if you can comp the property, you're likely to get financing. And I speak from experience on this because there was a container home builder at the beginning of COVID and they came to us and wanted us to do the loans. Well, the challenge that we had at that time were that there were no container home comparables. You know, we needed a couple container homes within, I think it was a three or five mile radius. I don't remember what the USPAP max guidelines are from for distance. I'm not an appraiser. I can get that information together if you want, though, Eric, and I'll shoot, shoot it over to you so you know um, how far out you can go for comparable sales. So it really comes down to, are there other like properties? Because then they can establish a fair value for it. Because if it's just the one... Um, you know, my grandfather used to say a poop in a punch bowl, then, you know, it's standing out. It's probably the odd man out in that scenario. But if it's an adopted architectural style for the area, then you're not going to have a problem. You see that in some areas where people will go in and they'll tear the older homes down and build an ultra modern home. And that home sticks out like a sore thumb for about a year or two and then you start to see them pop up all over because the area is being redeveloped and that's the preferred style of that community so there's some areas in florida that have done that very successfully some areas in california the area i'm thinking of in florida is delray beach you drive through there and it's all you know two one and three one little florida houses and suddenly now there are, you know, three, four million dollar super contemporary homes. Those are no longer difficult to comp. And this isn't a gated subdivision on the water. This is just a very cool coastal town with all of the amenities that people, you know, that people are willing to spend that high dollar to live near. So anyway, I got a little sidetracked, but if you can comp it, you can typically fund it. I hope that uh, answers your question. Maybe I'll make a t-shirt that says, if we can comp it, we can fund it. I kind of like how that sounds. Hey, guys, you hear the music? You know what that means? That is my cue. We'll be back in a few. Sit tight on the other side of this very short break. We'll be back with more of the Mr. Mortgage Show. Welcome back to the Mr. Mortgage Show. Call us now at 855-462-7292. All right, we are back. My name is Mark Itell, and you are listening to the Mr. Mortgage Show. Guys, if you have questions or comments, just call or text 855-462-7292. That number again is 855 462 7292. That is the anytime hotline. And Jen, as always, is womaning the hotline. She's back there driving the bus, guys. Or you can head over to MrMortgageRadio.com. That's MrMortgageRadio.com. And right in the middle of the page, can't miss it, big orange button that says get your questions on the air. Click the button. Type in your question. It'll pop up over here, and Jen will read it on the air for you. Hey, but, you know, let's uh, roll in, roll in, roll in. Let's keep those questions rolling. Let's throw it to Jen right now. Okay, Jen, when you're ready. Cynthia sent us this text. 
What is a typical down payment requirement for a vacant building lot? Hey, Cynthia, great, great question. Because as a lot of people are out there searching for their dream home, they just can't find it, right? We talked about the vast majority of homeowners right now being over 50. And we know what us folks over 50 tend to do. Sit tight, right? We can ride just about anything out. That's how we made it to 50. So there's not a lot of people selling and you might not be finding what you're looking for. And now, boom, hey, let me build a house. Let me buy a lot in the neighborhood I want to live in and build my exact dream house. Great, great idea. If you're going to buy the lot, you're typically... Now, there's always a little bit of fluctuation, but you're typically going to put down around 30 to 35%. And to a lot of people, that sounds like a big down payment. But to buy a vacant building lot, now that's one ready to go. It's already been approved to put a home on it. It's not raw land out in the woods somewhere. That would require a bigger down payment. But the building lot, you're around 30 to 35%. Figure 35 to play it safe. Now, I want to throw this out there as something to consider. If you're ready to build now and you've got a builder identified or the person selling the lot will give you the time to get the plans drawn and the builder identified, you could buy the property as part of a construction to perm loan and roll it all together and then put as little as 10 or 15% down. So, Or FHA only requires 3.5% down. I have no idea what the cost of the lot that you're looking at is. But if you can line the timing up, if you're ready to go, you can buy the lot as part of the package, if you will, and roll it all together and do a construction perm loan. And then you're putting three and a half percent down on the total cost, not just the lot of the total cost. So whatever the construction cost, if the lot's a hundred thousand and it's 300,000 to build, you've got a $400,000 cost. You put three and a half percent down. So Something to consider because play that out for a minute. If the lot was a hundred thousand and you had to put 30% down, that's a $30,000 down payment. But in that other scenario with a $400,000 cost and you only have to put down three and a half percent, that's what 12, 18,000 less money. And you're rolling it all together, less out of pocket and you're getting your construction financed at the same time. So this one requires a little bit of planning and a little bit of understanding the timelines. And if you need more information, I'll be happy to walk you through it. So I know I threw a curveball at you, but it's something to consider because if you're going to buy the lot and you're going to be starting construction soon anyway, it might be it might be something worth considering. So great question, though. I appreciate it. Hey, Jen, you got another one back there? Okay, go ahead. This one is from Jordan. I'm trying to buy a condo, and it seems my bank just keeps asking for more info. Now they want to review the budget and bank accounts of the association? The agent says she's never heard of this. Is this the same with all banks, or is Truist extra difficult? Hey, Jordan, this is another really, really good question. And those are famous last words of every agent. I've never had to deal with this. And I've been in the business 25 years. And, you know, anyway, somebody jumped into my mind. I, I, I'm I, sure not all agents are like that. But no, this isn't uncommon. So what's happening is in order to get conventional financing on a condominium, it has to be deemed warrantable. And to be warrantable It has to pass the condo questionnaire review, which includes things like the meeting minutes if the budget's not available. You know, is there 10% of the budget in reserves? Because, listen, after the Surfside 6 condo collapse, look at what happened by deferred maintenance. Deferring maintenance killed... Anyway, I don't want to belabor that point. So the lender, in addition to all the lives that were lost, which is more important than money... All that collateral was lost. So the lenders want to make sure this building is being managed well, that it's being maintained well, and that the monies necessary to continue that are there. So it's not necessarily one lender versus another, but if you're going through a conventional financing program, 
They're going to ask for all of that documentation. They're going to want to see the master insurance policy. They're going to want to make sure there's adequate uh, reserves. They're going to want to make sure that there's scheduled maintenance. Is Are there any big assessments coming up? You want to know this as the buyer. Why would you buy a property that's mismanaged and in disrepair? So I, I know it's frustrating. It feels like, my God, we just we just cleared this hurdle and now they're asking for more. But it doesn't sound to me like they're asking for anything different than another bank or mortgage company would require for a conventional loan program on a condo. So I hope that helps. If you've got specifics you want to talk through, call me when we're not on the air and I'll see if I can help you figure it out. But I appreciate the question. Thanks. Hey, Jen, go ahead with another one. Scotty sent this. It's been a long time since I've applied for a mortgage and I'm wondering if there are any true no income verification loans available today. The old no income, no asset verification. Remember those days, Scotty? Wow. Old school. Um, yes, there are. There are a variety of programs that don't look at your personal income. Now, from an investment loan standpoint, if you're buying you know, rental property, the landlord loan doesn't look at your personal income. It looks at the rental income. So if the rental income supports the debt, that's all they're looking for. And the ratios can be negative, meaning a property that's, you know, this is fantasy land math, but a $1,000 mortgage payment and an $800 a month rent payment doesn't disqualify that property from being approved. Um, there's some extenuating circumstances, but my point is the income from the property is evaluated. And if it's vacant, it's evaluated by the rent comparison analysis in the appraisal. So from the investment standpoint, the landlord loan is a great idea. From the primary residence, the home that you intend to occupy, there's a variety of programs that don't require income disclosure. Um, if it's as simple as you make the money, but you don't show it on your tax returns, um, bank statements can be re reviewed. The average of monthly deposits over 12 months can be considered income verification. But if you don't even want to go that far and you've got a load of assets, if you could pay cash for a property, right? Let's say that you've got enough assets that you could pay cash. That's a fundable scenario. There's asset depletion models that say, okay, you don't have enough to pay cash, but if you withdrew this amount over the next 84 months, and you don't have to withdraw it, it's just a calculation, assets divided by 84 months equal monthly income, boom. So it's none of those require you to disclose your personal income. You are disclosing assets. You know, that old no income, no asset thing is not around, but no income is. So there are a variety of programs. I'd love to know a little bit more so I could give you a clearer answer. And if you want to have a deeper discussion, just uh, give me a shout off the air. I'd be happy to walk you through it. But great, great question. We've really touched on some either misunderstood details of loan programs or loan programs that people have no idea even exist, like the HELOC on a duplex, or in this case, a no income verification loan. So, so we are covering some interesting ground today. I am going to toss it over to Jen for it. Oh no. That's my favorite song at the beginning of the show, but not at the end of the show. Hey guys, you hear the music? You know what that means? We've wrapped up another episode of the Mr. Mortgage Show. Man, time flies when you set me in this studio and let me just ramble about real estate and mortgage. Guys, I hope you had as much fun as I did. If you need us when we're not on the air, head over to MrMortgageRadio.com. That's MrMortgageRadio.com. Each week after we get off the air, Jen posts a recorded version of the show up as a podcast. So if you ever want to replay, it also is at MrMortgageRadio.com. But there's a lot of great info on there, news and anyway, links to everything we talk about. Guys, have an amazing week. Jen and I will be back right here next week, same time, same station.